we cannot seek to be invited to their party. We cannot dumb down what we're saying or simply be quiet about it so that they'll let us in. We don't belong in. We are relevant not because we are in with them. We are relevant because we're not in with them. And that's what you must see. If things keep going as they are, young men, you have no idea the importance of what I'm saying. This world is going to be filled with believers in Jesus Christ. But they're going to believe in Him as a way. They're going to love Him as a way. As a truth. And they're going to hate you. Because you say He's not a truth. He is the truth. He's not a way. He is the way. And they're going to say away with you. And they're going to say that you're not even worthy to be alive. Look, you don't have to start some new Christian sect and make your people wear strange clothes in order to be hated by this world. You don't have to take some uh, minor thing in Scripture and blow it out of proportion into the main thing and then be criticized by everybody on the planet. You just hold fast to this one truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life and that will be enough to send you to the gallows and to be hated by all men. But if you let go of that, you are no longer Christian. You are no longer Christian. Now I want to read here from, from uh, J.C. Ryle, his commentary on these, these verses. He says, the five verses now before us contain a statement of matchless sublimity concerning the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. He it is, beyond all question, whom St. John means when he speaks of the Word. No doubt there are heights and depths in that statement which are far beyond man's understanding, and yet there are plain lessons in it which every Christian would do well to treasure up in his mind. Like what one... Michael Card said one time, he said, give up on your pondering and fall down on your knees. There is so much in these first 18 verses of the book of John. In the first five verses, even the first verse, even the first phrase, do you realize that all of us well, let, let's go farther than this. You choose from among 2,000 years of Christian theologians, the greatest minds who've ever walked on this planet. You give them 85 years after their training, after they've come to maturity as theologians, when they're at the peak of of their intellectual capabilities and spirituality, then give them 85 years to work collectively on understanding and sounding the depths of John 1.1. 1, 1. And when they have finished after 85 years, they will not have even gotten through the front door of this text. Then I could say the same thing just about the word faith. You see what a task is before us? To know the Scriptures. To know the God of the Scriptures. We learn firstly that our Lord Jesus Christ is eternal. St. John tells us in the beginning was the Word. He did not begin to exist when the heavens and earth were made. Much less 
did he begin to exist when the gospel was brought into the world. He had glory with the Father before the world was. He was existing when matter was first created and before time began. He was before all things. He was from all eternity. We learn secondly that our Lord Jesus Christ is a person distinct from the Father and yet one with Him. St. John tells us that the Word was with God. The, the Father and the Word, though two persons, are joined by an ineffable union. Where God the Father was from all eternity, there also was the Word, even God the Son. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal, and yet their Godhead one. This is a great mystery. Happy is he who can receive it as a child without attempting to explain it. Receive it as a child. Work to explain it. But your ability to explain it, upon that, your faith does not rest. Your faith rests upon the proclamation of God's Word to you in the Scriptures. I have a dear friend named Rogelio Acea in, um, in Peru. He's actually from Cuba, and so that's what we all call him, Cuba. And he was literally found in a, in a dump, dying, drug addict. Was converted, could barely read. Now he's a pastor, and one of my favorite preachers to listen to. But God has given him such a childlike wisdom. It's astounding. And one day, when Cuba was first, uh, excuse me, when he was first converted, he was standing on a street corner and some Jehovah Witnesses came up to him. And, um, and they said, can you explain to us the Trinity? Cuba said, no. And they said, well, if you can't explain it to us, we won't believe it. Cuba said, let me ask you a question. Is God here right now with us as we're standing here? Is His presence here? And they said, of course it is. He's everywhere. He's, um, he's omnipresent. Okay, is, is God down there, a block away on that corner, standing where that man is standing? Is God's presence down there? And they said, well, of course it is. Like we said, He's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. Cuba said, can you explain that to me? They said, no. He said, well, if you can't explain that to me, I don't have to explain the Trinity to you. <laughs> there are so many things that we cannot explain. But they are true. They are true. And if anyone rails at you on this, any man in any intellectual discipline has to say the same thing. I'm sure the medical field is absolutely full of men operating upon truths they can't really understand. But if they didn't operate upon those truths, there'd be a lot of dead people in the operating room. There's a lot of things that we know to be true that we cannot understand. That's the seed of all human discovery. And if there are things in this world, this universe, being large but not being infinite, if there are mysteries here in a finite planet, how much more should we expect mysteries in an infinite God? Now, let's go on. We learn thirdly that the Lord Jesus Christ is very God. St. John tells us that the Word was God. He is not merely a created angel or a being inferior to God the Father and invested by Him with power to redeem sinners. He is nothing less than perfect God. Equal to the Father is touching His Godhead, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds. Charles Spurgeon, I was reading him recently, and he said that if he felt that the Mediator was only a man, or was, was an angel. He said there would be room and reason for, for despair, for doubt, for wandering. 
If he believed that the mediator was just a man, there would be room for such despair as just to sit down on a chair, to put your head in your hands and to weep. There'd be no hope. But if the mediator is God, then there is no reason whatsoever to doubt. He must be God. Newton brings this out also in one of his wonderful hymns. He must be God. He must be God for us to trust in Him. Would you really want to trust in something else? Even the highest angel in heaven, would you want to put your trust in Him? Would you want to put your trust in a man? Would you want to trust a demonstration